All right, our guest is Melissa Braddock. She's a member of Karate Canada and competes internationally in the under 68 kilo female Kumite division. Melissa, how are you doing? I'm doing well, and yourself? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us. I have some questions to, to ask you. First and foremost, uh, you recently competed at the World Games in Birmingham, Alabama. Please tell us about the experience there, how you performed, and what you took away in terms of learning experience from it all. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it was a great event. I found out, um, I would say about five to six days prior that I was going to be fighting. I got a call from Karate Canada saying that there was a spot open and if I would like to take it or not. And honestly, it was a tough decision. I was battling a lot of injuries. Um, I had to pull out, out of uh, the nationals for those reasons. Um, but it was a World Games event and didn't want to miss out on it. So we just kind of said yes. And with four trainings, I went and competed. <laughs> wow. So it was a great experience. Nonetheless, you know, it was tough. You're competing against top eight in the world. Um, so it's not going to be an easy competition. But I think given all the circumstances, it was a great event. Very interesting. I, I was unaware that, that uh, it, was, it was a five days notice and, and that you yeah. were injured. May I ask what sort of injuries uh, you, you were, you're dealing with? Yeah, but um, honestly, I've had a buildup of injuries. I've been going at it for two years now, you know, close to the Olympic run. I had uh, kind of gathered a few of them and uh, didn't have enough time to just focus on recovery. Then the World Championships came about and then Pan Ams right after that. So there were just nonstop events that didn't allow me to focus on recovery, more so kind of minimizing other injuries. So right. uh, the injuries I'm kind of dealing with are, um, I would say several, but the one leading up to the games was a back injury, uh, oh, SI joint injury uh, with a labrum tear in the hip. So wow. just dealing with that right now. Just got my MRI results, so confirmed my my diagnosis. And yeah, so it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> it, it's amazing that that you said that you said yes. In in all, you know you only had five days notice, and considering what you just described there, I mean it shows. Uh, it's, it, shows a, it shows a lot of spirit as far as wanting to fight and, and compete. Um, what sort of feedback did you receive from your teammates uh, and, and your coaches at, uh, at this uh, fight, at this competition, excuse me? Yep, afterwards, um, my, friend, my family and friends are always close by. Um, I would really say my family. Everyone in my family is involved in karate. Um, my dad was a former coach. Uh, my brother-in-law is one of my coaches. My sister is always there. She's always got my back. I have three sisters. They're always kind of messaging me nonstop when I do go to competitions. Um, so when I finished, it was just, everybody was just happy that I had gone and competed and had done what I could. And everybody was super supportive. Everybody was super proud. So it was a great response from them uh, once I did finish. It sounds like you have a great support system of, of uh, you know, people involved in karate that also happen to be family. I'm sure that's that's a huge added plus right in terms of getting advice from from trusted sources and incredible ones like your dad who's who's a former coach and so on and and your sisters as well i believe they have a background in the sport as yeah, well yeah. as you mentioned yeah. right moving on now to the pan american championships which were held in Wilmset, curacao in late uh, may of this year team canada came back with seven medals you won a bronze medal there give us a summary of your overall performance at uh, the, the pan ams uh, performance at Pan Ams, I would say I had some inner battles that I was dealing with um, and I went and overcame them once I was at the competition. Um, I went for gold. I ended up with the bronze. So on my end, it was a little bit disappointing, but leading up to those uh, championships again, I was not training. I had about uh, a few sessions in the week prior. I, just these injuries were really kind of holding me back, but mm. it was a mandatory event and I was not going to miss out on that kind of competition. So I did go. Um, so, yes, I think with the right training, with the right pre preparation, it would have been a gold medal. But unfortunately, um, I just I wasn't as prepared as I should have been. And uh, the one match that I did lose, it was, um, I would say, more of a mental game on my end that I lost. Um, so if I had won that match, I would have gone for the for the finals. If not, I ended up with the bronze. So, again, I'm happy with the results nonetheless. But uh, I am somebody who will always demand more to myself. and. If I don't reach my goals this time, I will set the same goal for the next championship. So next Pan Ams, I'm going for gold. 
Very interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to hearing about, a bit more about that in terms of your, your mindset. You seem like a very focused person. I also would like to know your opinion on the team, Team Canada's overall performance there at the Pan Ams. Can you put that in context for, for us and what that means for, for karate in yeah, Canada? Was, yes, that was, it was a great championship. So I think um, from my experience, I think it was one of the best um, so far. I know the last Pan Ams, um, there were a few medals, but this one, we think we doubled them, if I'm not mistaken. And um, yeah, but I think everybody performed really well. The team environment was nice. Everybody was, um, you know, getting along. It was, it was a good championship. We were in Curacao. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. So I think that, that kind of helped with everything. Um, but yeah, proud of, the, proud of the team. Yeah, Curacao, of course, is in the Caribbean for people who probably, I'm sure some folks have never heard of, of Curacao. Yeah, it is a small uh, country, but it's beautiful. <laughs> And, and it's interesting that uh, they held the, the, the championships there. As, you know, the, the many, many different countries were in attendance, of course. And the overall experience, you, you say, w was positive as far as being there and competing? Yes, of course. I think it was one of my favorites so far. Oh, wow. Uh, just so, yeah, the environment was nice. The, the locals were super nice. Um, the, the venue was well-organized nearby as well from where we were staying. So not too much traveling back and forth. Um, overall, it was a great experience. Right on. Now, it's interesting because you, you mentioned uh, the first two questions I asked were essentially about, you know, recent competitions. And, and the theme of, of injury is, is, is very common for, for any athlete involved in contact or combat sports. Now, you've, let, you've invested a lot of time in training and learning the sport. What does making the podium mean to you personally? Obviously, you made the podium uh, at the Pan Ams. Uh, the, the, the Pan American Championships, you got a bronze, you intended to get a gold, as, as you just mentioned to us. But what does making the podium mean to you personally? Um, making the podium for me just kind of solidifies that um, all the work and time that I put in did pay out. And, um, you know, before I go to an event, you can kind of feel how you're going to do more or less based on like your preparation. Um, even if you do prepare the best, sometimes mindset or just the day of it's not for you and you don't do as well as anticipated so just making the podium just it's kind of like the cherry on top the whole process behind is really where you put in the effort all the work all the you know satisfaction from each training um you kind of feel that prior and i think just going to tournament and and doing well is um just kind of the last thing you can hope for <laughs> Now, Melissa, a, a lot of people don't have, uh, I'm generalizing here, but they probably don't have the discipline, the focus, the, the determination, the drive to, you know, to attain some goals in, in their lives. If, if it's athletic, academic, yada, yada, you name it. But put in, give us some context as to how much training is required, uh, you know, over a span of, of, of one's lifetime to compete at the international level uh, for, for, for your sport? Because we're not, as, as fans com of combat sports, we may not be aware of how much time you people put in in training, you know what I mean, and all the ups and downs and, and the challenges, personal, professional, et cetera, and so forth. So if you can kind of give me a brief summary of that, if possible. Sorry, big question. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, it's hard to kind of put into how many trainings in a lifetime, I would right. say, but um, I have been training since the age of four. I'm 22 now, so... Oh. Uh, it's been nonstop karate. Um, once I hit the senior level, so once I turned 18, I started training two to three times a day um, with, uh, with my coach, Sandy Said. He kind of drilled me in. He, he put me to, onto a training regime and there was no budging out of it. It was three times a day, nonstop work, each session between an hour and an hour and a half. So um, yeah, it was tough. And then, um, yeah, I've kind of stuck with that same regime till now twice a day now I do I am a student so it's kind of hard to train three times a day so twice a day is my max um, on top of my schoolwork so yeah it just it has to be non-stop it's just a discipline of keeping to it and and setting those mini goals that you can obtain and um, you know checking off the checklist those goals and just working towards the the ultimate goal which is whatever championships you're working towards um, and yeah keyword discipline just you might feel like crap. You might feel, sorry, my, my language might not feel the greatest, but you kind of have to push through and just go with it and, and do what you have to do. That's how I'll say it. In terms of, so you, you mentioned that you're a student. I, I, tell us, if you don't mind, what subject you, you're, you're studying. 
And how do you manage between training and, and, and your, your studies? Like, can you give us an idea of your time management approach? Because I'm sure you're, you're a very busy person. Yeah, so I am on like my summer break right now. So it's kind of nice. I'm enjoying the time off and the laid back days. But uh, I do study cybersecurity at Sheridan. Um, and when it comes to training in school, it's just, it's, it's just kind of organizing your schedule where once you put something into your plan, you have to stick with it and you have to follow the time that you give yourself because in, in my experience, if I don't do it immediately, if I don't t- you know, stick to my schedule, everything starts to kind of get delayed or you miss out on a session or you miss out on a study session. Right. And, um, yeah, for me, that kind of causes a lot of trouble. So depending on whatever school schedule I have going on, I'll work out my morning session, which is usually like the weights or conditioning. I'll work that in between my classes. Then I'll come home, have my study session for two to three, four hours. And then I go for my karate, uh, karate training in the evening and then come back. And if I need to kind of go back to studying, I have some time available always. If not, I go to bed early. So, yeah, it's... Not- it's- <laughs> it, it's it sounds pretty serious and 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 organized. It's interesting too that that you're studying cybersecurity because I almost want to ask you if there's any transferable skills from the world of of karate, you know, philosophically speaking, yeah. to to that of, of cybersecurity. But that's probably a whole different podcast, so I, I won't ask you. Yeah, there is a lot of similarity. Interesting. Oh, yeah? yeah. Please, if if you can give us the Cole's notes version in like a minute, I, I'd be happy to. To hear that. Sure. So I'm all, I've, I've just done my first year. So I'm just kind of learning some languages and learning some algorithms with how computers work. And honestly, when it comes down to a fight, it's, it's the same thing. You always kind of follow an algorithm when you're, when you're competing, if a person goes right, you know what to do. You follow one algorithm. If they go left, you follow another and so on. There's so many different situations that you get put in, in, in a match that repeat themselves. You know, it's, it's the same kind of movement or it's the same uh, attack or reaction that you'll do on a certain attack. So a lot of things are the same. And when it comes to computers, you have those algorithms that you follow more or less. So in, in a really, really general scheme, it kind of is similar, but as you right. can narrow into it, it does get more uh, difficult. When you're fighting or training, do you ever think about your studies or any principles you've learned in, in, in cybersecurity? <laughs> I'm just curious, do, do they ever cross your mind? Like, oh, that algorithm doesn't um, work here, no? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like that, but on, yeah, sometimes I do have my trainings and I'm kind of stressing about an exam or, or a test or, right. or some study I have to get back into. That'll cross my mind. So I've had trouble in the past where kind of just separating my school life from karate life and not letting those thoughts from school come into my training sessions or vice versa. If I'm studying, not allowing those training thoughts to get into my, into my head. So that's something I've had to learn over the past year. I did focus prior to this year only on karate. So hmm. my whole life was just karate and training for, for about two to three years. So um, having that on and off switch was was difficult for me, but uh, not impossible. Yeah, it, it's really interesting that, that you're studying that field because it's an ever de- it's very in demand right now and it's forecasted to be in demand uh, like for, for, for decades because of uh, just the reality of our connectivity and our, and our, you know, all, all these services, uh, you know, we're all online and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's cool that you're studying that all the best with, with your studies, as well as with your karate, of course. Now I have a question here in terms of, you know, people train in combat sports like karate for fitness, some for self-defense and many other reasons, of course, what role and purpose does karate play and fulfill in your life? Um, For myself, it's just something that I have always been exposed to, have always been involved in. So it's hard for me to not be involved. I mean, um, growing up, my older two sisters, um, we have a big age gap, 10 and 13 years apart. So I watched them go through the same things that I went through, you know, junior team and the senior team and world championships, Pan American championships. They both have world medals, uh, both have multiple Pan American championship medals. Um, so I grew up kind of following their footsteps with our father being our coach. So it was just something I was always around. My younger sister also followed along. So her and I did train together up until age of 18. Um, my mom is a black belt, you know, (laughs) it's just in the family. Um, so for myself, karate, along with it being a sport and something that I, uh, like a passion of mine, I think it does teach a lot of great values, um, discipline, respect, 
um, it does build character, 100%. You go through a lot of tough times. You have to kind of get through some good times, some bad times. Um, for me, it's just a part of my life, and it's hard to kind of distinguish my regular life from it. Uh, it's just so intertwined. Um, so that's what karate means to me. For me, karate is just life. <laughs> It's very cool f from what you're describing as well. Like it's 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 a whole sort of family approach to to karate. You know, you mentioned your your mom's a black belt. Your sisters have competed. So you guys have really a, a sort of a, a unique, I would imagine, a unique sort of perspective on, on the sport because you grew up in it. But like, it's not like you were the only member of the family who did it. The whole family did it, which is yeah. which is fascinating. Curious to know uh, for how okay. There's the recreational stream of any combat sport, right? The people who just train for fun and for a variety of other reasons, and that's fantastic. And then there's the competitive stream, uh, elite level folks like yourself who compete internationally. Going from recreational to, to competitive, for, from your own experience, uh, what was the biggest uh, shift or, or lesson that you learned? going from from that to to where you are now yeah um i wouldn't say there was too much of a shift for me i competed i know I, my parents kind of threw me in competition as soon as i was i started so four or five i was already competing okay. um, but like the elite level i would say i hit around 12 i started competing at the national championships in the 14 15 division around the age of 13 so 12 i started my i guess elite level and then sure. qualify for a team at 13. Um, so it's just been nonstop. But I think the, the biggest thing that I learned kind of transitioning from juniors to seniors because uh, was learning that losing is or not winning was OK. And everything is in the learning experience and you have to take it as it goes. If you just kind of dismiss the losing and just focus on the bad, the negatives and, and not really taking the time to break down what happened and what you can improve from and what you can learn from, um, you're not going to go too far. And out of juniors, I did really well during my junior career. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was something that was just, it, I was lucky or it happened. I worked hard. I know all that kind of stuff. But once I hit seniors, it just didn't work. All the stuff I was doing from juniors wasn't, wasn't, you know, cutting it. So right. I had to, uh, it's like my, my coach on the side took me in and kind of broke me down and, rebuilt me into the fighter I am today. And um, yeah, that's kind of, I'm not sure that answered the question, but. Oh, uh, no, absolutely. I, you did, you did. So so there was, a, there was a transitional phase going from junior competition to yeah, senior. Yeah, that was my biggest, my biggest transition there. The, the toughest one, I think, to swallow. Just a quick follow-up on that. In terms of, of that, that uh, you know, it's okay not to, to win and, in, in, you know, it's okay to, to lose as, as part of, uh, you know, learning and, and developing as a competitor. Within the karate community, how open is that conversation amongst competitors, especially at, at the junior level, who are moving up to, to the senior level is, is, you know, because everyone is competing, everyone wants to win, but when you don't win, there's, there's a wave of emotions that, that come, that, you know, the, the, depending as yeah. to where you're at. I, I guess the question I'm asking is, is within the community, is, is there a lot of support as far as uh, people being able to express the fact that, you know, Hey, it's okay that you didn't win. Like, is there support around that? Or is there, is that sort of discussion not uh, uh, exercised? Uh, I think in Canada, they do a good job of that. You know, if someone doesn't do well, there's a huge support system around them. And, you know, they, they take it lightly, not, not too seriously when they do lose. So I think that most of the athletes in Canada are, um, I wouldn't say okay with the idea of losing, but they are just kind of, you know, it, it's hard to put it. They're not easy to accept it, but they, you know, they, they work with it better than I would say some kind of foreigners that are in the country, like myself and uh, my father, who was my coach as a junior, he's from Bosnia, Eastern European, former Yugoslavia. So for him, he was very hard on us in terms of the, the whole losing. It was not really, uh, you know, you didn't get the high five, you didn't get the good job afterwards. It was kind of like, well, you should have done this, this, this. And at the same time, he was building us to be really tough and really, you know, ready to attack any situation. It was 
something that we didn't learn to um, take the loss and, and deal with it and, and learn from it and then do better the next time. So I think it just depends on your upbringing. It depends on your environment that you're in and your specific small circle that you're in that'll kind of determine how you deal with the loss or, or a wind. Um, as a country, as a whole, I think they do a good job of it. But that's, again, speaking on a general term. I think individually, everybody right. has their own uh, battles and own uh, obstacles they need to overcome. Yeah, no, agreed. And it's interesting when, when you speak about uh, some different parts of the world and, and, and their coaching approach. I, I think for the most part, it's definitely more for, from what you've described. It seems much more, uh, you know, hyper competitive and, 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 and that sort of very black and white. You know, there, there's no ambiguity. You win, you win, you lose, you lose. And, and I know I'm generalizing when I say this, but I... I from what little I know and from what I've seen, it seems like the rest of the world seems to have that more, uh, for lack of a better word, hardcore approach, which, you know, ha has its pros and, and, and benefits. I, anyways, that's a whole different <laughs> conversation. Uh, yeah. And it really depends, I guess, on, on the sport uh, and, and, and style and, and so on. But uh, next question I'd like to know is, you know, as a competitor, or like next question I'd like to ask is, as a competitor, what are your goals and aspirations uh, in the sport? Uh, my current goal right now are the Pan Am Games. They are set to be 2023, um, I believe in Chile. Um, so my next competition right now is in April, NA Cup, followed by the Pan American Championships. Um, so I'm taking the time right now to just focus on recovery and then get back into my training, my training regime. And uh, that's my next target. Um, as for long term, the following World Championships, and uh, we're still crossing our fingers for 2028 Olympic Games. So hopefully we'll see what happens with that. But those are my current goals. It's interesting I, the way you answered. You, you're very in the present because it's not like you didn't go into the future. Yes, you, you, yeah, you said my my current goals as in the, the now. Yeah. So the, I like that, to look at my goals at what's at uh, sorry as what I can do right now and not right. so much like in the long term, I do have long term goals, but you know, those things, they kind of change every now and then the path does change as it goes. And right. I like to kind of uh, just adjust to it. Um, so in terms of long term, long term goals, they're very just kind of up for grab, but I sure. like to focus on the present and the, the ones that I can kind of grasp earlier. No, it, it makes total sense. I, I, I appreciate yeah. the, that answer. I just have a follow up here. Uh, and and I, I have to ask this because I'm I'm a fan of various combat sports. So you know, for, I'm just I'm just saying, just saying. Uh, do you have any aspirations of fighting professionally in other combat sports after your amateur career is done? Uh, you know, like is, is does that has that thought ever crossed your mind? Yeah, I get asked this a lot. Of um, course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I could do it. Um, given my body and the state that it's in right now. Um, you know, I love combat sports. I love watching UFC. Uh, those girls are killer. The, the guys are amazing. Like, it's, it's a great sport to watch. It's, right. it, you can really see, like, the game plans and everything that goes into it. Um, but unfortunately, I just don't think I could do it. I love training it here and there, like, to do some full contact. But just with all the stuff going on, I think I've, I think I've used and abused my body to the point where <laughs> I'll stick right. with one sport for now and – I'll watch the rest. <laughs> Fair enough. No, that, that's great. What, uh, in terms of training and competing, what keeps you motivated to train and compete uh, at the highest level of your sport? Um, I think um, it's a hard question to ask. I'm not sure what really motivates that passion. I think it's something, again, I've been doing since I was so young. Um, and I just like to put myself in difficult situations and figure a way out. And um, for me, karate is that. I have another tough goal that I like to set for myself. And for me, that just keeps me going. Um, I'm somebody who really needs something to work towards. If I don't have that, I might, I can feel like my days start to, they don't, they fall out of routine. I don't perform the same. I need the pressure. I need to be kind of squeezed here and there to um, just live my life. I'm an extreme person. I would say like that. <laughs> Very interesting. And, and if I can ask a follow-up on, on that is, if let's say if karate was not in your life, uh, what would you be pursuing? I know it's, it's very speculative because obviously yeah. karate has been in your life, 
but uh, it seems, you know, when, when for athletes like yourselves, you guys put in so much time t- towards this art form and sport. Uh, it's such a huge investment, right, at, at all levels. So, the, you know, I'm just curious to know if that sport was not there, what, what would you be doing with all that free time? Um, definitely would be used up somehow. Um, as much as I love free time, I'm not a fan of free time. For me, I like to have it with balance. So I like to have it with obviously doing something and then have the free time. So for myself, I don't know. I would probably be in a different sport. I would um, be using the time towards something else, you know, maybe take into the school or I'm not sure. I've always loved sport. I've always been an athletic person. I've always used to be on every team growing up in middle school and high school. So, um, yeah, I definitely would be in some sort of sport. I love speed skating. That's something I wish I would. I, I did. I love watching it, and I wish my parents had something in speed skating. <laughs> well, you know, it's never too late. I mean, speed skating is Maybe a winter not. sport in, in the Olympics, yeah. so you're, you're, in a, you're in a summer I sport. It's crossed my mind for the last, you know, two to, two to three years, so... Maybe I'll Do give it. it a shot. <laughs> yeah, why not? It's transferable skills. As long as you know how to how to skate, you know, hell, you could yeah. skate and and drop kick your opponents. Yeah. <laughs> joke, joke, joke. That's just a joke. But uh, if I could go back to the question on motivation and and training, if yeah. I know it's it's a tough one to ask. I guess if I could follow up, I would say, um, when you're training, are there different levels of focus uh, mentally that you tap into? Like if we go back to your recent uh, competition or even, yes, to, to, to the World Games in Alabama, like you only had five days. You put in four sessions, I believe you said, of, of, of training. Yeah. So and, and you've got, you know, as, 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 as you mentioned, injuries, which, which is unfortunately it's, it's, a, it's a common reality, right, for contact and combat sports. So in those four sh- sessions of training, what did you focus on the most and, and how did you like, tap into a level of motivation with such uh, such short time, only what, five days? Yeah, um, I think as soon as I got the phone call, um, right away, it was just kind of hit with like a, what, like a surge of energy. You don't know what to do with yourself. I, I had to talk with my uh, family, um, my coaches and see what, what to do. And right from there, we kind of just decided yes. And we just went straight into, uh, I would say like, the last preparation before competition, there's a bunch of phases that we kind of go through. We went right into the last phase. We're just sharpening your tools, we kind of call it. And all I could really do is just um, practice my reaction timing so I could, you know, work with some partners and, and get my reaction kind of going because that's something that does tend to fade if you don't train it nonstop. So I just tried to get on top of that right away. Um, some game plan, some, some tactics really quick, but really, there wasn't much I could do. All I could do is just kind of get my mental state grounded and feel my body and, and deal with what I had at the moment and just kind of go for it. Uh, that's, that's how I'll put it. And uh, I, I guess you, you just, you have a f- uh, faith or trust in, in yourself, obviously exactly. that, that you've developed exactly. o- over time. Yeah. Um, now this next question here, I'm, I'm curious to know what aspect of karate do you think is uh greatly misunderstood by the public and combat sports fans? It's a general question because I think yeah. th- there are different communities and, and different target audiences that would probably have different uh, misunderstandings or, or stereotypes or so on and so forth. But I'll, I'll ask this the general, what aspects of karate do you think is uh, greatly misunderstood by the public yeah. uh, and combat sports fans? I think a big one um, is the contact. Um, it is seen as like a non-contact type fighting, I guess, which is um, to me mis- like misunderstood because there is a lot of contact. Um, the only thing we just don't have are the knockouts. So when it comes to any face shots or head shots, we can't um, fully follow through with a punch. We have to have that pullback aspect, which is kind of how we determine a point as well. So if there is a, a good amount of contact, it's just not enough to knock out your partner or your, so your opponent. And if you do knock them out, you are disqualified um, in, in some situations. Um, karate, again, it just, I think it's at the point where it's a little bit confusing to watch to somebody new also coming in. You know, there's sometimes you don't know when the point is, you don't know, sometimes you see a great punch and nobody scores it, or you see a body kick or head kick and there's no flags. 
and then sometimes something goes through and you're like, how did this score? So I think that right now is kind of um, making the sport very difficult for outsiders to come and watch. It's something more if you're involved in, in the sport or you, you know people in the sport, so you kind of you understand the rules. Um, somebody coming in, it might be a little confusing to watch, and I fully understand that. You know, sometimes we watch matches and we're like, how did that even score? <laughs> or, you know, that should have scored. Um, so I think that's something the sport needs to work on. Um, and on, in my opinion, to be honest, but um, yeah, I think what's greatly misunderstood is the contact aspect and that it's kind of seen as like a, a weaker sport. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. It does, the sport does rely more on speed and, and distance um, opposed to just kind of hitting and landing a punch on an opponent. So there are a lot of things that come into effect. And again, from the outside, it's hard to determine, but when you're inside the sport and you understand the rules, it does make sense. Yeah, it's 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 interesting that, that you mentioned that the, the, the contact uh, aspect because I mean I I read some comments and sometimes I, I see that I'm obviously I'm I'm not an expert on the sport of, of karate I'm just a combat sports fan but I think one thing I can appreciate is uh, you know not getting hit full on uh, probably means that competitors don't have long term you know injuries to their brains concussions and so I, I'm sure that there's probably injuries elsewhere. But the probability, I don't have statistics. I'm, I'm not looking at, at any data. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying this. But I would imagine that it's not as pervasive as, as other sports. Or m- maybe it is, correct me if I'm wrong. But I, I, and I, I, I mean, even as a spectator, one can appreciate, you know, the diversity of different combat sports as, well, as what they have to offer and view them and, and watch them uh, based on their, their own rule sets and enjoy that for what it is. I think we have a generation of, of fans who uh, probably predominantly grew up on mixed martial arts. So, mm-hmm. you know, and they, they have a certain expectation of what a fight yeah, is supposed to look sure. like. For but sure. it's, the, the Western world here, it's, it's a bit different. That's why karate is not as popular um, as a sport at, in North America. Um, for those reasons, I know it's, it's huge in, in Europe and um, South America, even in right. Asia, of course. So, um, and Africa. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, no. Behind. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But it's uh, you, you've provided an interesting, uh, an interesting answer there in, re- in regards to, uh, to to what's misunderstood and and the rules. And I, if you can give us a brief sort of overview of the rules for us, yeah. Uh, you know, the, from the points Yuko, Zari, Ipon, and so on. Yeah. So the the matches are three minutes uh, stop time. Every time the referee does stop the match, the time stops. Um, and you score your points through various techniques, head and body punches are one point, uh, body kicks, um, whether they're to the back or to the stomach are two points, um, and then three pointers are any head kick or a takedown follow with an immediate punch. So that's how you score your points and winner uh, with the most points wins the match. You do have some warnings here and there for like stepping out or um, you know grabbing for too long. You know, people like to wrestle in, in clinches. We don't have mm-hmm. we don't have the long clinches, um, and there's a lot several other warnings that I can't really describe right off the bat. Fair enough. No, I, I was just looking for something more. There's more a general. bunch. There's uh, a lot of rules when it comes into it, but more or less, you're scoring points. Winner of the ma- of the with the most points wins the match, and you advance. Awesome. Just a quick follow up on on the throws you mentioned. Throws are they pre- predominantly sweep sweeps like uh, foot sweeps, or are they? We have sweeps and throws. We okay. have sweeps and throws. Um, the rules are you can't throw over the hips and so no all hip throws, like you see in judo a lot. Right. Uh, has to be kind of over the thigh area, so just below the hip. Um, okay. If you're going for like a hip throw, um, yeah. you can catch the person's leg if they go for a kick and throw them from there as well and score the you just score a punch right away to score that three points. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of ways to get your opponent on their back and and, and with the with the punch. Can you lift like uh, like a uranagi or like a suplex sort of? Uh, um, with their body? both feet on the floor, you can't go for that lift. Like you uh, can't grab and, and right. lift. It used right. to be the rules. They took that out um, a few years ago. We also had hip throws as well that were taken out. Um, the rules are nonstop changing. Right. The they were just kind of modifying it. But we did have a lot of throws uh, prior to 2010. It was nice. Um, but yes, you can lift the opponent if they kick, you can kind of lift them up and throw them. But it's, right. again, controlled. You're not lifting and kind of slamming them onto the floor. You'll, it, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> it very, very, <laughs> very interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to diving more into, into the rules, but I, I do appreciate yeah. that. 
curious to know what are the uh, key characteristics to a great karate competitor and how would you describe yourself in terms of uh, your strengths as a competitor? Um, I think a lot of, uh, for any karate competitor, I think everybody will agree that discipline is key. You need to be on top of yourself as well as your trainings. Um, uh, respect is there, respecting your opponents, that's huge. Karate was built off that. Um, creativity, creativity is big. Not being a one-dimensional fighter, being able to use situation and be creative with it and um, take it as it goes. The best fighters that I see out there are super creative. They'll pull things out of places that you wouldn't expect. You know, there's a lot of cookie cutter fighters that fight more or less the same or have the same techniques. Um, the ones that are outside the box tend to do the best in my opinion. Um, and sorry, what was your second question there? Oh, and in terms of your own strengths, uh, how would you describe your, your karate strengths? How would you describe yourself as, as a fighter? Um, that I'm still trying to figure out. I would say I'm fairly young for the karate game. I'm only 22. So I'm seeing what works for me. The past few competitions, um, I've been playing around with some stuff. I do like to counter fight a lot. Um, I like to be the pressure fighter. Uh, timing I'm okay with so I just I, right now I'm trying to figure out what suits me best and what works best for me and what I can build off of I'm still in that kind of building stage um, so that that's pretty much up for grabs still maybe in a few years from now if you, hit, if you uh, we have a conversation I'll have a definite answer <laughs> very interesting uh, my, my next follow-up actually is a little bit on that uh, in, in regards of uh, you know focusing on on development and training how do you train? What do you train for? Uh, and I know you gave us somewhat of a summary of, of your routine, but g give us an overview of, of your, you know, your, your, what you train for in terms of it, the purpose and the objective of, of your training. Yeah. Um, well, it depends on my competition, the scale of the competition that I'll put number one, number two, how much time I have. Um, right now I have the luxury of time. I have a lot of time to, to prep. Usually I don't have that. I have about two or three months. So um, right now I would say it's focusing on injuries. That's phase one, getting my body back into order. Phase two, just kind of uh, going back into the basics, going back into your techniques, working on your techniques, um, learning some new ones if, if we can. Um, then you kind of go into the tactics and then you have your sharpening, which is the last few weeks before competition where you just work on um, getting ready for competition. And then you have your tapering time off where you let your body recover. Um, on top of that, just the karate aspect, then you have your physical aspect, which is like your weights, your conditioning, getting your cardio up. Um, a lot of things that go hand in hand together, mobility. Um, so that's more or less my, my training plan. Um, in depth, it would just be per week. I do a, big, a weekly basis, so I won't go too specific into it, but that's more or less that. Sorry. All good, all good. It, this is great. I'm curious to know what, in terms of the, the quote unquote, the psychological aspect, the, the, the mental aspect of, of the game and, and your preparation and routine. Do you have any, do you have a routine or music that you play or books that you read? What, what's, what's your approach to that as far as, you know, getting yeah. that ready getting yeah um that's a that's a good one uh my music taste changes every competition i know some people like to go i used to be very you know same same playlist same order and you know whatever yeah, superstitious i would say like wearing the same type of clothing or socks or whatnot i tried to drop those habits because they got a little overhand with me mm. i'm a very um uh, I guess like obsessive person. So once I got into those certain routines, I believe that was the only way that would work for me. And now I'm just trying to be very um, relaxed by the situation, kind of going with the flow. So when I get to a competition, I see how I feel, you know, eat what I can that's around me. Um, prior to competition, obviously I like to eat my, my carbs and my proteins and playlists. I like to find something that will kind of calm me down, but pump me up at the same time, not overdo it, not underdo it. So it kind of depends on the event and how I'm feeling and I like to play around with it. So nothing, nothing specific. Um, I don't really read. I wish I did read more. <laughs> I'm trying to, um, but you yeah. You try audio books as well. I, I know a lot of people yeah, who don't like reading, but audio books are great, you know? That's something I should definitely try out. I think that would kind of calm me down. I'm an anxious person. So I do get to 
get a little too too excited so keeping my calm is a big thing for me and mm. uh, finding what works for me at the competition tends to be the best option I've been doing that for the past four years now and um, it's been relieving not having to stress on making sure I have everything that I usually need to do well like the specific shorts I wear under my gi or <laughs> right. uh, those, that's just an example but sure yeah Hey, in terms of karate in, in Canada and, and, and so on, like what, um, what can you tell us about the sport and its popularity and participation uh, in Canada? I think karate is very popular in, in, uh, in Canada. Um, now the sports side isn't. I think there's a whole open circuit side of karate. I'm not sure if you're aware of them. They have their Please own... Please ed educate us on it. Like, give yeah. us your, your insight. So, um, sport karate, anybody who does compete on the national team, the, the official national team and the provincial team, we we're all fall under WKF, so the World Karate Federation. Um, that's where the World Championships, Pan American Championships, World Games, Olympic Games, they all kind of follow this organization of karate. Um, every country throughout and there's a lot of other organizations out there as well um, I think like uh, off top of my head, I know JK there's one there um, they have their own organizations and the open circuit has their own organization and they have their own world championships own Canadian championships and they have their own stuff going on um, it isn't to the same scale as the WKF championships are um, but they are still big and they tend to attract more of the North American um, people, right. um, like the U.S. and Canadians. So I think there's a huge market there for North America. I'm not too aware of the other, other countries and other parts of the world that they're really involved in it. Um, so yeah, karate is definitely very, very popular. You see karate dojos everywhere. Now, which dojos focus on sport are very limited um, in Ontario, I think there's only about a handful. Sorry, where I'm from in Canada, I'm not really sure how many there are throughout. But yeah, it is definitely very, very popular on the recreational and less on the sports side. Yeah, because traditionally, of course, uh, like I, I grew up in, in the 80s and I remember, uh, you know, when I was a kid, like when, when anyone mentioned martial art, the the default would be karate, right? Yeah. As, as the sport, everyone, oh, I'm going to karate dojo or, you know what I mean? And, and it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to, to hear this from uh, as far as Canada, uh, you know, it, it, it is definitely a popular sport as, as you described, but there are different, uh, I guess, sort of tournaments and, 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 you know, folks who are just doing it recreationally and, and yeah. some who compete, uh, as you know, as uh, at the sport level, but in terms of like, you know, when we look at uh, in terms of competition, from your perspective, which regions of the world tend to produce some of the high, the most competitive and talented karate competitors? Uh, and where where would you? Sorry, I know this is a tough question. Where would you situate Canada into that mix? So, which regions of the world produces? Uh, the best karate competitors and, and, and where does Canada rank overall in your opinion? Yeah. Now, like fr from my opinion, um, not sure exactly. Obviously there's a statistics who has the most medals, who does, who has the best athletes, but from my opinion, I believe Europe um, dominates. They've been dominating for a while. Um, majority of the European countries, um, North Africa is also, they do very well. Um, and Asia, a lot of the Asian countries, um, Japan, of course, right. that's the home grounds there. So right. um, I would say those three areas um, do the best. South America as well. South America is up and coming with a lot of countries like Brazil. They, they're they dominating. Um, U.S. has some good athletes. Um, but yeah, if I were to rank it, I'd probably go Europe to, to Asia, North Africa, that kind of region as, as producing the, the best right now. Um, Canada right now, unfortunately, isn't the, the greatest. Um, we have come a long way. Um, I know there's a few athletes who, who do do well from Canada. Um, but yeah, it's very minimal compared to the size of the country, the number of people that we have here, and to have the, the people that actually do well, the comparison is very drastic. I mean, I'm talking about like three to four people max on the national team that do well internationally opposed to the whole teams of other countries that almost all medal <laughs> when they go international. So it's something that needs to be worked on. Um, um, 
kind of elaborating on that, sport isn't too focused on in Canada. It's not really um, pushed for, I'll say it like that. Other countries, a lot of funding, they, they push these athletes, they, they get a lot out of it. The athletes themselves are covered once they, they kind of make the national team. They have a lot of things that kind of go for them once they do do well. So it does push and motivate the younger generation to try and do well and be the best of the best because you get a lot of incentives, you know, national teams covered, you get your exp expenses covered. I know a lot of countries that do get apartments once they're on the team, they have places to live. They're very well taken care of in Canada. We just aren't on that level. Um, everything is more of a self project. I would say each athlete has to get upon themselves to cover all their expenses um, deal with all the, the training. There's no national team coaches that kind of help you out. Everything is for yourself. So that's something once you make the team or if you um, have hopes of making the team, you have to accept and work with and just kind of take it as you're alone in this project and you just have to deal with it. <laughs> right. If you really, really have the passion, go for it. Otherwise, you're not, don't go into it expecting to, um, you know, someone's gonna, someone else is going to take the wheel. Right, you right. should be in full control at all times. So that's how I'll leave it. Very interesting. Now, of course, uh, karate made its uh, Olympic debut in its Birds Nation at, at Tokyo 2020 at the Olympic uh, Summer Games. What does the inclusion of the sport to the <laughs> Summer Olympic Games mean to karatekas worldwide? What, what does karate being part of the Olympic Games mean to, to, to you and all these other competitors worldwide? Yeah, I think when we made it into, into Tokyo 2020, it was, a, it was crazy. Everybody was super excited. Everybody, you know, the level of competition went up by a lot. Everybody was fighting for those, you know, eight spots that were available per, per division, the three divisions that uh, were available to each uh, gender, sorry, four with Kata. Um, Unfortunately, we aren't in the Olympics after 2020. It was a tester sport and we didn't kind of, we didn't make it into a, a permanent sport. Oh, so, well, you didn't. Okay, this this is news to me. It goes to show how much research I've done. Yeah, uh, I'm no, sorry, no. I, I, I thought you yeah, guys no, were no. officially, I thought you, you know, you made it in the Olympics. Yeah, we all, we all were kind of crossing our fingers and hoping for it. But after uh, Tokyo 2020, we didn't come through. I think um, there were three other sports that did and, and some that didn't. Um, unfortunately, we didn't make it. We wanted the sports. So um, they are trying again for 2028 Los Angeles. So that's a, everybody's kind of looking forward to that and seeing how that goes. Um, as for why we didn't make it, nobody really, really knows why. There's all speculations in terms of, you know, there's always something going on in the back end that nobody really knows. Um, but yeah, it was, it was great while it lasted. Um, the qualifier was amazing. I just came short of qualifying. I was the fourth spot out of the top three that went. So wow. just, just missed the qualification. And uh, on a side note, my boyfriend did qualify. We were training together at the time. So Daniel Zinski, he did qualify. That was a great experience. And I watched him train. I watched him prepare for the games. Um, while he was at the games, it was, it was a whole other story. So um, I was thankful to kind of live through his experience. Um, but yeah, it was, it was great. Tell us about uh, him a bit more because I believe he was the only Canadian who competed, right? Yes. Or who, who made it there, which is, uh, and I think even his qualification match was pretty dramatic, right? Yeah. So if you, if you, can, of, if you, yeah, can, if you don't mind, you just give us context no for it because I, I almost think it's one of those stories uh, that I don't know, should, we should probably be hearing more. Um, yeah. I tell him all the time he should talk about it. <laughs> he's very humble. He's very, he keeps to himself. He's, uh, he's very quiet about things. He just kind of keeps his head down and works. So, well, which is awesome. I'm just saying, like, it's, it's very symbolic to be like the only Canadian to be yes. competing at Tokyo yes. 20 in, in karate. And even that, that whole road there was, you know, I, I'm not trying to look at things from a documentary or perspective, mm -hmm. but I'm like, I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is an interesting story that. Yeah. Why are we hearing about this, you know? Yeah, I should, uh, I should push him to kind of post more on social media or something and talk about it. But, um, yeah, leading up to the games, or sorry, the qualifier was a whole story on its own on us, too. You know, we were really training by ourselves through COVID in a basement. We, uh, we lived at a, in a basement apartment at the time. We designated one room to, like, our dojo room. Wow. And it was super small, like, like four by four of those karate mats that we were able to work on. 
Um, we got to sneak into dojos here and there. They would kind of let the back doors open for us. We won't specify the dojos so they don't get in trouble. We were in lockdown, <laughs> but we were, we were able to kind of train with the minimal, minimal people. Um, so that whole qualifier in itself was a, was a, a story to, to be told, but I'll leave that for another time. Um, at the qualifier, he technically didn't qualify. He had been disqualified um, through stepping out. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the ring and I was watching from the warm-up area I just finished my fights and I didn't qualify I was watching on uh, on a phone the matches that were taking place in, like the venue like right downstairs it just wasn't able to go in and the kind of camera zoomed in on his foot and it didn't step out and it was about that far from the line like uh, like about two inches so I was freaking out like he didn't step out. I'm like yelling in the, in the warm up area. My, one of the coaches, um, she was kind of walking around doing, she wasn't able to watch. Um, so she was just kind of keeping to herself and the other coach sitting at his, at his uh, chair didn't see this, um, you know, goes to show Canadian coaching. <laughs> That's for another topic. Um, so they didn't see what happened. I was on my phone watching and I'm just yelling and I went up to her and I'm like, she didn't step out. Then he came out and he's devastated. He came out to the warm-up area. He's just wow. like, he's just like, he's, he, his face looked like he was just so like distraught. He's like, I didn't step out. Like, I know I didn't step out. And I was like, you didn't. And I was yelling at him. I was like, you, like, you didn't step out. Go figure this out. And in karate, you have the rule where, um, within a certain time frame after the match, you have um, the opportunity to go protest. So you put down 500 euro and you protest whatever just happened. And if the protest goes through, you get your money back. If not, you lose the, the sum. So they went back and they were, you know, rushing to get in, him and the coaches, and they were kind of trying to get their point across and they put down the 500 euro, or I'm not sure if it's exactly 500. There's a, there's a sum you have to put down. And uh, they reviewed the footage and they won the protest. So they put them back in the match and he had about three seconds left of the match and he was winning. So in the last three seconds, he scored one more head kick uh, against Netherlands. And uh, yeah, he ended up qualifying. <laughs> that's, that's extremely dramatic. Like the, the, that, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know. It was a whole situation. Man. It was like, it was crazy. Netherlands yeah. came out super excited. They just qualified. Coaches were cheering, you know, they're throwing their gear around. And then he went back, he lost the match. He came out, I saw Netherlands just ripped, you know, they were so irritated after that. <laughs> Wow. It was great, but he qualified, which was the which was the crazy part, which he deserved to qualify. He didn't step out. He fought right. amazing the whole the whole the whole tournament during the finals. He earned his spot. So he, right. he deserved to go and we're happy that he was able to go. What a what a fantastic roller coaster ride of emotion and and uh holy moly. Just you know, from what you've just described there, I'm just like, man, that that is like what a unique scenario, I, I suppose. And uh, yeah, I also forgot to mention that um, the coaches gave us 10 minutes to warm up. So wow. they had messed up the scheduling at the Olympic qualifier for finals. So on top of that, um, both of us had very little time to warm up. I'm talking like 10 to 15 minutes for myself. I was first match. He had 20 minutes. So for him to go and do what he did with, you know, a whole day of competition, six matches, and you go and you kind of, taper off for a few hours to eat and recover and then you come back and you have 20 minutes to get back in the mindset and bring your body up to par and then qualify Uh, that's a story on its own so I think I had to say that I don't share that I haven't shared with anybody yet but I think it's time that people kind of find out what really went like what went on behind the scenes for him to get to where he went wow Um, so yeah yeah it was tough it sounds yeah. It sounds like a very unusual high level of, of duress and stress. Like ten minutes is, yeah. is nothing. Like that's uh, that's yeah. that's, that's and, and, and the yeah. And I mean the fact that you know at, at the end, as you mentioned, he he qualified. What what a journey that that is. Uh, I think I saw. Uh, I'll I'll wrap up on on this interesting topic. I saw a video he had posted just after the the olympics and it was a it was very interesting where he's just talking about the whole experience and it was it was a very cool video and it almost kind of it seemed like a preview to to something much bigger like you know like a foreshadow in in a novel when when the character says something uh like you know what i mean like anyways i i tend to look at these things 
from uh, from different perspectives. So maybe I'm looking in too, too deeply or or maybe not. Maybe I'm, I'm No, maybe not. We'll see. You know, he's full of surprises. One day he's on one one topic, other day other one, and he's the type of person that if he's going to say he's going to do it. So <laughs> Well, all the best to, to him. I have one last question for you and what's the best advice your dad has ever given you in karate or in life? Or both? Um, and I asked this because I, I saw the video. Sorry, I'm, I'm ranting here. I saw the video, uh, the, the the one, uh, you, you know, that, that video you guys did back in 2018? Yes, yes, yes. For, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, wow, that, that's not, that man is a character uh, of lived experience. Like you could just, you just know, you're just like, this is an individual, like a very a unique person. And I was just like, I'm sure he's got a lot of interesting advice. So I had to ask you this because yeah. I know it's probably a personal one. You don't have to answer if you don't want to, but what's the no, best okay. advice he's given you? There's, um, it's tough. It's tough to kind of just figure out right now what to say, but I think the best thing that he's ever taught me, um, I would say is just the discipline. He's an extremely disciplined human being and um, everything he does has to be more or less like perfect. Um, I'm talking about if it's, if it's screwing a hole into a wall, he'll have to measure that it's at the right angle. You know, he's just super, no, no, I wouldn't say OCD, but very like, um, likes to have things done a, a very specific way. Uh, that's, that, that's coaching though, right? That's a coach, Yeah, you know? So that, that's that. something I took away from him and, um, my my other coach and said they're along the same um idea they coach completely differently and coach um their own ways and they're very different human beings altogether but something that i find similar between the two and something that i took away from from both of them is having that extreme discipline and um just sticking to whatever you say you're gonna do and mm. and go through with it um even if it doesn't come out the way you want it to like just just go for it and do it and um Repetition is key. That's something I'll always remember is repetition is key and repetition is key in the right way. So not just doing it because you want to hit the number of 100, but doing maybe 50, but 50 perfect punches or 50 perfect kicks. And um, again, just sticking with your trainings. And again, all I can emphasize on is discipline. It's huge. <laughs> it, yeah. it comes to every aspect of life, no matter what type right. of training you're doing, it's just sticking with it. And some people disagree and kind of say you have to be a bit more loose and figure out what you want to do or, um, you know, to each their own. Absolutely. And, and it's an excellent piece of advice, the discipline and that, that drive for continuous improvement and, and, and refinement. I, I think it's fascinating advice for both your, your sport of karate and life. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for answering that question and answering all, all the questions. In fact, this has been quite an interesting learning opportunity for me to learn about your sport and, and to learn uh, about you and fellow competitors. I, uh, I have no more questions left. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to, to f follow you uh, along as, as you compete. And maybe we'll do thank this. Uh, we'll do this uh, again sometime. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. <laughs> All the best. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.